So the question about the, the up and down of economic cycles and how that affects our field and the fact that many people, both young and old, are concerned about what's going to happen, the markets are going downhill, and uh, maybe we'll all lose our job, will there be any work? I mean, these are, these are reasonable questions to worry about. Um, my parents' generation went through the Great Depression of the 1920s and 30s, and, um, and, and then they went through World War II, like your nation did, and other problems after that. I mean, we both were involved in a war in Korea, and there's terrible stuff that's happened, and people come through it, and the, the economic cycles have gone up and down. The one thing I will say, though, is that the best time to do planning is when no one's building and nothing's happening. And the best time to figure out what should happen when the economy comes back is when it's in the trough. And because then when it starts to come back, you know what to do and you're ready, you've got plans. So, so it's a great time for planning, for thinking, and for encouraging businesses, agencies, and professionals to make up plans of what should happen, what they wish they could have been working on, what needs to be done. And one of the things that, when I was young and I was kind of poor and wandering around not knowing what to do with myself, I would make up projects that I thought should happen. Then I'd go find somebody who would help finance it, at least pay me to do the drawings to make it happen. And some of them happened and some of them didn't. But making up what should happen, ideas, good ideas, when people see them, they think, hmm, that's interesting. And some people think, oh, I could make money doing that. And other people think, oh, I could get elected doing that. And other people think, I could get a job doing that. So coming up with plans of what should happen, because quite often people have been busy because people are bringing them things they wanted to do. Now it's time that the professionals can say what they would like to do that they think the other people should be doing. So being, there is a word that we use in the West called entrepreneurial. But that's, it's making up things that should happen. You know, making up things and, and, and promoting them yourself. That's what an entrepreneur is. If you're a designer, we just call it being creative. <laughs> it's, 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 there's, this, there's another word we use, we call it creativity. But um, it seems that the field of architecture and landscape architecture quite often end up thinking in periods of a great economic boom, they end up feeling like they're slaves to developers and that businesses are just doing all kinds of terrible things that they're having to work on because that's what there is. So the economic boom periods are not necessarily our best architecture and our best work. <laughs> that some of the great ideas come when things are difficult. Uh, it's true with all artists, actually, <laughs> that, that being left to yourself and thinking, what should I really be doing? not what the boss tells me to do. And, and so we know that there are some serious environmental issues that need to be dealt with. The first, my first year at Tsinghua, the first lecture I gave, I don't think it was all that well received by some of the senior members of the faculty of the government. There. One of the things I said was every river in China is polluted and they could all be cleaned up within one generation. It's a design problem. It's a will problem. If you want to have a good environment, you can plan it and build it. And I said, and that's what the school should be doing. And I think that when you say, well, gee, there's this terrible thing called climate change. It's going to drive us all nuts and kill all these people and trees are going to die and everything's going to flood. Uh, and people run around panicked. But what they should do is say, oh, climate change. Oh, well. We should be designing differently. How would we do it if we had all these people and it was hot and we didn't have a lot of air conditioning because we don't have enough electricity? Now what do we do? Well, actually, we used to know how to cool buildings naturally because they designed them better. And so maybe we should redesign and rethink. So you actually could do some environmentally creative things for the future that would be harder to do in the West, harder to do in Europe. Uh, and you could invent projects that need doing that have to do with water, that have to do with solar 
issues that have to do with energy, that have to do with how people live together, that have to do with children's development. We could do that. So, I, so my notion is to the people who are worried about their future, I'd say, Jesus, there's so much to do. You better get going. <laughs> you, know, that's a, you, you have a promising future if you're willing to work hard. And you have to deal with some people that you might not like. And you have to bring them around. And you have to be able to argue with them in a way that they'll think it's their idea. <laughs> and they'll think that they're going to get credit for it. You have to work with some unsavory souls to get good things done sometimes. There are also very generous, wise people, but you don't always find them first. Landscape architects need to be able to get their hands on some of the resources and take them away from people who are doing foolish and stupid things environmentally. So we need to find a way to take the money and say, instead of doing this dumb project that's going to cost a billion dollars and is not going to make life better or safer or nicer for children or old people, but but if we take some of that money, we don't have to have it all. Just give me this little bit. I want to do this other project that will actually make a difference. In the United States, the basis for licensure, the basis why the state licenses landscape architects and people without a license can't practice it, is based upon safety, and it's based upon liability, and it's based upon property. It's not based upon history, it's not based upon aesthetics, but it's based upon, so, so the tests and the ability to license you are what, we only do that for things that have to do with human health and safety. One of the core things is the applied science that we use in our work, ecology being one of them, hydrology being one of them, <laughs> climate being one of them. Because we believe in making plans where people are not in a floodplain. They're, they're, we understand about erodible s slopes. We understand about a series of what I'll call bioengineering things that we apply in our work. Um, we're not, it's not like there's no core discipline. There really is. I mean, but uh, we also, like architects, know that we have uh, certain obligations to cultural legacy. And, and that that is not trivial, that the loss of uh, our heritage is also important. And so that's a core knowledge. So, so there's science, you know, which has to do with meteorology, hydrology, geology, soils, <laughs> okay? Then there's structures, right? I mean, we should know about structures. And we should know about plants and horticulture, soil science, I mean, all that stuff, if you're running a good discipline, people, you would, if you don't know it personally, you know how to go get it because you know you need that in the project you're doing. So I will go get an ecologist or I will bring in a good soil scientist. And so that's, that's part of our makeup is to know what is needed in the design of habitat for human beings that is safe, healthy, and socially viable. And if those aren't core disciplines, I don't know what is.